uh, well, today's readings uh, turn on hospitality, uh, hospitality in the literal and normal sense, having people into your house for a meal, and uh, hospitality in a wider and deeper sense, I think. Now, Abraham, in the first reading, welcomes three passing strangers, lays a table for them in the shade, and feeds them. And Martha welcomes Jesus into her home and busies herself preparing a meal. But Abraham welcomes more than mere human beings. He welcomes angels, God's messengers, and he and his wife are promised a son a year hence. Mary, Martha's sister, welcomes Jesus in another way, sitting at his feet and listening. St. Paul, in the second reading, mentions how the pagans, the non-Jews, have welcomed the message of the gospel, Christ among you. He says he is happy to suffer for the church. In a sense, he hosts suffering in his own body. He accepts it. And uh, the, today's alternative communion antiphon, in the same light, says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, says the Lord. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door to me, I will enter his house and dine with him and he with me. So there's something large here. There's something key to our humanity and key to our Christianity. Now, if we uh, push hospitality, as it were, say good things about it, which certainly we must, we do have to say something first, because there are some things in life, some things that pass our, the tent of ourselves, as it were, that we shouldn't welcome into our lives. Uh, Scotland, we heard recently, has the highest drug death rate in the EU. Obviously, it's not good to host drugs, nor pornography. Um, when the refugee crisis was at its height, Pope Francis was strong in encouraging the countries of Europe to open their doors. At the same time, though, he did call for prudence, measure, realism about what the host societies can cope with. Well, here's something that slightly baffles me, because uh, sometimes we are so, so, so very careful about what we eat. I mean, we have to be sometimes, but sometimes you wonder, is this a bit of a fad? But we're very uh, cautious, critical, you might say, of the hospitality that our stomachs and our bodies are going to show to what's on the table in front of us. Well, fine. But why not be no less discerning about what we think, our thoughts, what goes through our mind, what we read, what we watch, what we host with our eyes and our minds? Abraham's angels brought life. I shall visit you again next year without fail, and your wife will then have a son. But not everything that passes by our tent, not everything that comes into the house of our lives and our hearts uh, brings life. Jesus brought his presence and his teaching to the home of Martha and Mary. He brought calm to Martha and uh, affirmation, we'd say, to Mary. It is she who has chosen the better part. So let's be discerning in our hospitality. St. Benedict says when a guest comes to the monastery, there must be prayer first to avoid the delusions of the devil. St. Ignatius of Loyola says that when an inspiration comes from God, it's like water uh, dropping gently, almost imperceptibly, into a sponge. But when it comes from elsewhere, it's more like water hitting hard stone, splashing, ricocheting off. So let's be discerning in our hospitality. 
we have to say that first. But I don't say that so that we shouldn't be hospitable. No, not at all. It's a matter of life and death, actually, for us at every, le at every level. And historically speaking, hospitality has always been strongest uh, among Bedouins, among desert dwellers, because they know if they don't welcome the person into their tent, into their group, then that person will literally die. Abraham is, as always, a wonderful model here. Now, it's striking, isn't it, that he was sitting outside his tent in the midday heat when uh, he could have been having a siesta in the shade. And was he on the watch, perhaps? Was he so hospitable that he was just hoping somebody would come along uh, that he could welcome into his house? It's striking, too, how he runs to meet them. Now, he runs to them. Now, he was actually a very old man, and in the episode just before, uh, he's just been circumcised, so it wouldn't have been, uh, well, it would have been rather painful, I would have thought, running to meet these guests. And it's striking how, first of all, he says, well, uh, there's water, I'll wash your feet, uh, here are some deck chairs, as it were, to sit in the shade, and I'll bring you some bread. But then, still running, he selects the best calf, and his guests are offered, well, really veal uh, in, in a rich cream sauce. They get a very good meal. And Christian tradition goes further here because the three men are not just three angels. They are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as in the famous icon of Rublev. So hospitality is welcoming God. Now, in the Gospel, a fascinating gospel, really. Martha isn't doing wrong, and she naturally has our sympathy. There's no sign that Jesus had, as it were, sent a text beforehand saying, you know, I'm on my way and I'll be arriving shortly. Uh, suddenly he was there, and Jesus didn't just mean Jesus. It meant at least 12 other hungry young men with him. Suddenly, all these people uh, come crashing into your house, and surely they all ate the meal that she prepared. So no wonder that she was distracted, worrying, and fretting all over the place, is what the Greek suggests. Well, she was a bit naughty, though, wasn't she? Because, you know, she, she's angry with her sister, and she gets Jesus to, t she wants Jesus to tell the sister off rather than she doing it herself. That's not quite. Thing. But there's something far more going on here. Um, there's a movement from the old to the new. Because you worry and fret about so many things, and yet few are needed, indeed one. Many things. For the good Jew to serve the Lord, there were 613 commandments to observe. Now, that must have been distracting at times to know which one you're meant to be performing now. But for the disciple of Jesus, at the end of the day, there is only one thing to be done, what Mary does, to listen to the Lord, to Christ, and obey him. It surely reminds us of the other Mary, Jesus' mother, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. You know, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. Mary pondered all these things in her heart. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And what Mary, uh, Martha's sister, does is actually remarkable, because the rabbis of Jesus' time didn't have women disciples. And Mary realized her rabbi was different, and so she takes the position of a disciple. She sits at his feet, and she refuses the stereotypical role in the kitchen or wherever. So there's a liberation going on 
here around Christ. This is Christ's feminism in many ways. So, in the end, Christ redeems the great human value of hospitality. He affirms it, he purifies it, and most of all, he fills it with himself. And we are called, as we know, the gospel says it again and again, to host him in everyone, in the sick and suffering, in children, in our fellow believers, in his image and likeness, man. We're called to host his presence, his word, his Eucharist, his death and resurrection, his spirit, his will for us. Not many things, just one thing. We are called to host him. And what, in the end, do we all long for? What do we most want? Isn't it to be hosted, to be welcomed, to come to a place, a home, where we are loved and received and accepted and forgiven? Isn't it the house of the Father? Isn't it to be at table under the shade of a tree with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and those we love? That's what we long for in the end. Well, if we do, in the days allotted us, in our little life, let us host one another and bear each other's burdens.